Good afternoon and welcome to this amazingly rescheduled celebration of generosity and service to Georgetown. Today we are very pleased to finally be able to celebrate our colleagues who will receive the university's Vicennial Medal. In addition, our alumni and friends who are to be inducted into the 1789 Society. And to Dr. Barbara Baer, Professor and Chair of the Department of Neuroscience and Senior Associate Dean of Biomedical Graduate Education, who has been invited and has accepted <laughs> to deliver the annual Life of Learning Address. So please remain standing, if you will, just a little longer for the Vene Creator Spiritus and the opening prayer to be given by uh, Ms. Sahar Siddiqui, Chaplain in Residence. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Let us take a moment to gather ourselves, take a deep breath, and bring our presence to this space and time. God, who was Al Jami, the gatherer, we thank you for gathering us today to celebrate the many accomplishments of our distinguished faculty and staff. Bless each of our relationships and allow us to always be of service to one another. God, who's Al Amin, the knower of all, bestow your blessing upon all of our efforts to continually seek your knowledge. Allow our insights to enrich our lives and encourage us to build a community of righteousness and justice. God, who is Al Hadi, the guide. Lead us to find your presence in every step of our journey. Remove any obstacles that divert us from your path. God, who is al muqit the nourisher, feed our bodies with acts of goodness, our minds with peace and patience, and our souls with unceasing remembrance of gratitude of you. Indeed, it is you, God, who is al-Rashid, the righteous teacher, who is aware of all that we know and all that we do not know. You know what matters are good for us and make good for us that allows each of us to serve one another. Put your blessings upon that which is good for us and which pleases you. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Georgetown annually recognizes dedication to the university. Those faculty members and academic administrators who have served the university for 20 years are honored by the presentation of the Vicennial Medal. We extend a special welcome to this year's medal recipients, to their families and friends who've gathered in their honor, and to the department chairs who have joined the procession today to help us mark this achievement. 
We also recognize with gratitude all holders of the Bicentennial Medal, a number of whom are seated right in front of us and are distinguished by the medals they are wearing. So check them out at the reception. Some of our retired colleagues have also joined us for this occasion. It is that important to us. Welcome back to the Hilltop, those of you who've come. For this special occasion, we've produced a film to document the contributions of these honorees to the university. After the film, Dr. Elliot Crook, Senior Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs and Professor and Chair of the Department of Biochemistry will present the gold medalists on behalf of Dr. Edward Hilton, Hilton Executive Vice President for Health Sciences and Executive Dean of the School of Medicine. Then Vice Dean and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Jane Aiken, will present the silver medalists on behalf of Dr. William Trainer, Executive Vice President and Dean of the Law Center. Twenty years, almost half of my life has been at Georgetown now. It's a very quick 20 years, and I, I can't believe that it's gone by this fast. Somewhere out there on campus is a student who was born on the day I started work at Georgetown. I'm in denial. My students are the same age, and so am I. It is a surprise. Time has flown by, and I think probably because I enjoy my job. This is my one and only job. When recruits ask me, you know, what do you really think about Georgetown? I say, I never left, so obviously I love it. When I first started teaching, I thought that I needed to be in control of all the information. I find more and more that I don't. It really is a partnership. It's always a rewarding experience to give up the control and let the students pick up the materials. I am the non-native speaker on the Chinese faculty. I'm always the one who sends the message that, yes, you can do this. I can teach a, a class on African culture and that is, for most of them, something very different. But they are very interested. They want to know more. I got to teach poetry. That was really the great thing. Well, I fear the blank page, so I ask them not to start with a blank page. I ask them to start with a form and urgency and some notes. I'm trying to help them learn how to think like a lawyer. It's reasoning by analogy. It's applying already established doctrines to new sets of facts and new conflicts. Nothing makes me happier than seeing students who think ethics has to be the most boring thing in the world come alive. I always say to healthcare professionals, who you choose to be any day literally has the ability to determine or influence how people are born, live, suffer, and die. I teach graduate anesthesia students. In the morning when I walk in, oftentimes they're exhausted, they haven't had the coffee yet. But once we start talking about anesthesia, they start to get really into it. Their level of engagement is what feeds my fire, if you will. The important thing for a good teacher is to have empathy. I have an implicit contract with them. I will push them really hard to learn, and they can push me really hard to help them learn. My lab, fundamentally, we focus on drug resistance research. We hope to help cure malaria. It kills half a million people a year. I don't know if exciting is the right word, but it definitely motivates the heck out of us. I developed a passion not only for the research, but also for training students. I have been really lucky to do something that I really enjoy. a boy, good adjustment. I get to teach life through a game I love, and uh, I can't think of anything better. For me, it's about getting a group of students who, from different backgrounds, different parts of the country and the world, sort of working together throughout the whole year to make them into a cohesive team and a team that is you know, among the best, if not the best in the country. I really enjoy helping the students. It might be their first time ever in an archive and they're looking at, say, a letter from Abraham Lincoln, an authentic letter, 
and their eyes light up. Well, it's always amazing working with a uh, primary source document. You know, it's kind of a pathway to the past. The best part of my job is being the sleuth and finding that one obscure source. I had always relished that part of, of being a student. I used to sit near the reference desk and just eavesdrop. You know, reference librarians held the keys to the information kingdom. We are information pushers. We get people hooked into the information so that when they leave, they'll be lifelong learners. So that the sources we introduce them here, they'll use in the real world. I support students. So I try to lead them through their experience here and make sure that they have a transformative, positive um, experience at Georgetown. I get a lot of satisfaction knowing that I may have had even just a teeny little part in their journey. As you watch, you know, 900 students cross the stage, it's, you know, 900 examples of why we do what we do. Colleges uh, have a very important role in raising adults of the future. It's not so much what they learn in the class, but what goes on around the class, around the university. In the financial aid office, our goal is not just to get the students the money they need to attend. Our goal is actually to allow our students to imagine their situation in the future and to encourage them to count any opportunity as a viable one. And part of the work here really is about not just assuming that there's one way to do things, but to really think about what works best for an individual child, what works best for an individual family, what works best for a community. Well, I, I would say that this is the work of Georgetown. I guide our tenure-line faculty to scholarly publication at the highest ranking and most selective university presses and peer-reviewed journals. And just help me understand, because I, yeah. I have three words that I use to govern my office. They need you. Editors need you. I show them that the freshness of their perspective is actually a massive asset. What has kept me here? There are many things to love about Georgetown. It occurred to me that the formation I received at Georgetown is the biggest formation of my life. The reason I love it is because it keeps changing me. I hope we're doing something like this in 20 years and talking about how 40 went. like we're already a bit ahead of the script here. So will the gold vice medalist please rise and come forward as your name is called, and I promise I will try to do as best a job as I can in pronouncing them. The following individuals are the recipients of the gold medal for 20 years of full service to the university. Michael Bailey. Jennifer Bocher. <laughs> Jeanette Kachan. Michael Callahan.
Stella Cohn Scali. Sylvia Dermala. Ladan Eshkavari. David Gewanter. Jill Hollingsworth. Philip Kafalis. Amadou Kone. <laughs> Sue Lawrenson. Rebecca Lundgren. <laughs> Ludisha Malkova. Beth Marhenka. Mark McMorris. Judith Miller. <laughs> Charles Pruitt. Paul Ropey. <laughs> Anne Rosenwald. Carol Sargent. Andrew Schoenholtz.
Barbara Shoney. Maria Snyder. <laughs> Scott Taylor. Giuseppe Tosi. Janine Turner. and Rohan Williamson. <laughs> Please join me in just congratulating all the gold by Senate. also pleased to recognize this year's recipients of the Silver Medal for 20 years of part-time service to the university. Will the, civil, the, the Silver Vicennial, Vicennial Medalist please rise and come forward as your name is called. William Ball. Jeffrey Burnham. <laughs> Craig Isco. Richard Leon. Jonathan Rush. Emma Violin Sanchez. John Walcott. Joy Young. Please join me in congratulating all the silver medalists.
1789 Society is Georgetown's most distinguished philanthropic fellowship. Today, we recognize those new members of the society who've given so generously to support our academic enterprise. In a special way, I welcome the new inductees who are here with us today. Your support allows Georgetown to attract the most talented students and scholars, as well as to grant them the resources to enact positive global change. We are deeply grateful to you and to other 1789 Society members for such remarkable generosity. Thanks to your gifts, we are able to create faculty chairs, assure financial aid to deserving students, and to provide outstanding campus facilities. Your vision and your leadership provide us a beacon for Georgetown's advancement as one of the finest and the most world-renowned institutions of higher learning. Thanks to all the members of the 1789 Society and our other benefactors, Georgetown's future ability to support the innovative projects of our creative faculty and our students have again been assured. So this evening we salute and induct nine new members into the 1789 Society recognizing their notable and generous contributions to the excellence of Georgetown. Will the 1789 inductees this, here this afternoon please rise and come forward as your name is called. First, the International Institute of Islamic Thought. Christine E. Weber. <laughs> Paul All Obert. Also being inducted this year are the following members, Janet Kling and Michael Kling, Janice K. Billingsley and Robert L. Billingsley, the Cloverfields Foundation, J.T. Ty and Company Foundation, Kelly and J. Jacobs, Nancy J. and Jeffrey L. Stack, and Joan W. and Philip A. Vasta. Please join me in congratulating the new members of the 1789. I now have the honor to introduce our 48th president, John J. DeJoya, who will offer some remarks and introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you very much, Bob. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you for this very special occasion in the life of our university community. Each semester, we convene for our faculty convocation 
In the fall, as we honor the extraordinary contributions of our scholar teachers and the promotion and tenure of our faculty, we engage a leader from outside the Georgetown community to share their perspectives and experiences in the academy. Today in our spring convocation, we celebrate the longstanding contributions of our faculty and academic staff, of our most dedicated supporters, and we hear reflections from a distinguished and outstanding member of our faculty here at Georgetown. To our newly inducted Vicennial Medalists and past Vicennial Medal recipients and to the members of our 1789 Society, we thank you for your extraordinary contributions to our community and for your presence here today. To Barbara, I want to th thank you for sharing your reflections with all of us in our life of learning address and for three and a half decades of extraordinary teaching and research in our community. And I look forward to introducing her to all of you in just a moment. And to all of our guests, family and friends who join us today, I want to thank you all for being here. For decades, this ceremony has provided a moment for us to acknowledge and to explore our way of life as a community. We come together as an entire faculty to pause and reflect on our mission as members of the academy and to honor colleagues who exemplify the very best of our community. Ours is a community grounded in a nearly 500 year old tradition of learning in an enduring commitment to knowledge and the disinterested pursuit of truth, to the formation of young people, and to, the, and to the belief that there is a good that we can achieve together that we could never hope to achieve alone. This tradition is alive to us in many ways, and most especially in our efforts to ensure that ours is a community where a life of learning can be sustained. Each year, we welcome new members into this community. They come to know our way of being, the way of life that distinguishes the academy from other places in our society, and the unique way that this way of life manifests here at Georgetown. They come to know this way of life through all of you, our faculty, our academic staff, and their engagement with knowledge. Earlier this year in describing the forma mentis, literally the form of mind or way of thinking of universities to a group of faculty and students in Santiago, Chile, Pope Francis described our way of life as, quote, teaching how to think and reason in an integrated way, close quote, providing, again, his words, an education that integrates and harmonizes intellect, the head, affections, the heart, and activity, the hands, close quote. And he went on to say, whenever a professor, by virtue of wisdom, becomes a teacher, one is then capable of awakening wonderment in our students wonderment at the world and at our entire universe waiting to be discovered. We are fundamentally a place of learning, of exploration, of integration and synthesis, a place of formation. And our pursuit of knowledge across all disciplines begins with a sense of possibility and purpose that there is more that we can know more that we can understand, more that we can share about our world, more that we can do together. And there is an inherent optimism in our way of life, as well as a restlessness, pursuing our work alongside our colleagues who share this way of life with us, provides for us a sense of consolation. This sense of consolation, this community 
can help sustain us as we seek to push the boundaries of knowledge and prepare our students for leadership in our world. So as we reflect on this way of life that we share, we have the extraordinary privilege of hearing from a member of our community and her life of learning here at Georgetown. A graduate of Ohio State University with a doctorate in pharmacology, Barbara's career has been dedicated to understanding the ways in which the mechanisms in our brain communicate with our immune system. In 1983, she joined our community in the Department of Pharmacology, having recently served as a Special Assistant for Science to the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Her work during these years included studying HIV through an effort at the National Institute on Drug Abuse in 1992 and studying drugs of abuse, including opioids, and the impact of certain types of stress on the immune system. After about a decade in our Department of Pharmacology, she moved to the Department of Neuroscience and served as vice chair of the department before becoming its chair in 2005, a role she continues to have today. From her research on drugs of abuse to her service on national advisory boards and groups, including as a, mem as a member of the presidential transition team for the Department of Health and Human Services in 1988 and 89, she remains at the forefront of teaching and scholarship on the immune system. Today, her work seeks to advance our understanding of the diseases of the central nervous system and approaches for early detection and evaluating various therapies. Barbara's also played a significant role in shaping our commitments to our graduate students, providing exemplary mentorship and guidance to our graduate students pursuing advanced degrees in pharmacology and neurosciences. In 2011, she was appointed Senior Associate Dean for Biomedical Graduate Education, and in this role, she has created important professional development, training, and partnerships to support the formation of our students. In recognition of her many contributions, in 2011, she was inducted into the Magis Society of Master Teachers, and in 2013, she was recognized with our Biotechnology and Biochemistry Programs Leadership Award. Throughout her extraordinary career, whether engaging with students, sharing her expertise with colleagues, or serving as a PI on a long-term training grant, she has advanced our understanding of the immune system's relationship to the brain in important ways and providing critical training to future generations of researchers. We're very proud to have had Barbara's contribution to the study of medicine, and her leadership in our community over the course of these 35 years. It's now my honor to invite to the podium Dr. Barbara Brayer to deliver this year's Life of Learning Address. to follow, huh? Thank you, Jack, for those great, very kind remarks. So President DeJoya, Provost Groves, Bicennial Medalists, inductees to the 1789 Society, deans, colleagues, friends, family members, students, both past and present. It's such an honor to be here, invited to give the Spring Faculty Convocation Life of Learning Address. I thank you all for coming and share, to share this moment with me. When I got the request last December to meet Jack in his office, I had no idea why. I had just talked to him at that fall faculty convocation and so I must have been on his radar screen for something. When I arrived at his office, he seemed like he was really happy to see me. So I assumed he was gonna ask me to serve on yet another search committee. <laughs> Instead, he floored me. He asked me to give this address. 
I wondered, so I was speechless for the first time in my life. I really tried to talk him out of it. I told him I wouldn't be good at it, and there had to be a better person that I could help him choose. I thought that might change his mind, and then and, and asked me to uh, give him another suggestion, but I was wrong. He told me he really wanted to hear my story. And also, he said, I could talk about anything for as long as I want. <laughs> How could I refuse such a request? Well, it turns out that fulfilling this request was a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. I started from a position of uncertainty. I wondered, since I'm a basic scientist, do I talk about research accomplishments? Do I talk about teaching experiences or leadership moments? The more I thought, the harder it was to describe this real essence of my life in a life of learning perspective that this address is all about. Then I actually did something that made the challenge even worse. I read past convocation speeches <laughs> of several other Georgetown faculty. This was predictably a humbling experience. They described achievements that made my head spin, achievements that transformed our community and our world, things that made my life feel even smaller. The first thing I did to get back tra on track, which is what a scientist would do, is get data. I began logically to outline the chronology of my entire life and to see if there were theme themes that would become apparent to me. The more difficult that it seems, and when you're as old as I am, it can take quite a while to do. It ended predictably with nothing but a list of events I'd experienced and people that I had met along the way. I let the list sit a while, and I gave, my time for the, gave myself for the first time a time of reflection. Finally, I realized something really important. My life of learning story is mostly about the people who helped me and influenced my decisions and accomplishments along the way. That's a pretty big crowd of people. It included parents, children, colleagues, mentors, staff, friends, chairs, and even presidents. The decisions and accomplishments I listed were the kinds of things that look great on a CV and the stories that we tell when we look back on our lives. But in both cases, I realized there was an emerging common theme one that I had followed from my earliest days. I realized that the most sustainable path to excellent accomplishments and accommodations is paved by adhering to one certain principle. Show up and do your job. <laughs> it was a cool moment for me a moment of discovery and affirmation that reminded me of the values that have been instilled in me by my family and my mentors. It was also a moment of sheer relief because as humbled as I was by the accomplishments of the colleagues that gave this talk before me, I realized it was the one thing we had in common. One value we all shared, regardless of the difference in abilities, knowledge, or perspectives, that work ethic was something we shared across the board. We all show up and we do our jobs. So for the next few moments, I'm gonna talk about what it meant to me to show up and do my job. I'm also gonna talk about some amazing things that have happened because of it and make a few confessions along the way. So in the words of Mark Twain, he best summarized the early days of my journey of, of learning. He said, college is a place where a professor's lecture notes go straight to the student's lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> this is probably true, and although we as educators may not want to admit it, learning is a lot of what you do outside of the classroom. This was certainly the case with me. I was an army brat, first generation college graduate, 
product of a Texan father and a German mom who celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary last year. <laughs> and they're still there. <laughs> Thank you. My family rarely stayed in more, more than one, two, my family rarely stayed more than two years in one place. I started grade school in Japan, then France, and then finished it in El Paso, Texas. High school years began in Washington State, continued in Florida during the Cuban Missile Crisis, then back to ta Texas when my dad was in Korea, and when he returned, we were off to Germany. Throughout the experience, I had some good teachers, some not so good teachers, and some that were in between. But one principle reigned true. It was my responsibility to show up, do what was asked of me, to listen and to learn, I guess you could say it was the kids' adage version of show up and do your job. In my case, that determination made up for a pretty average abilities. I'm smart, but certainly no genius. But by the time I graduated from Wurzburg High School in Germany, I had been inducted into the Honor Society, was senior editor of the annual, became a cheerleader, and was elected the homecoming queen. <laughs> Thank you. I was also, so I'm not finished yet. <laughs> I was also the top woman's single player on the tennis team. And it wasn't because of my forehand or my serve but because I was the only one who showed up. <laughs> and I gave it everything trying out. So I was rewarded for all of this by having the opportunity to go to college and major in science at a satellite campus of the University of Maryland in Munich, camp, uh, on Munich, Germany. I'd love to tell you, I went into it with some kind of mature awareness of my potential, but it isn't true. I took all the math and science courses that were offered, but I also took time to travel, attend concerts at the Deutsches Museum, discover the inside of the Hofbra House, and star in the musical play, The Boyfriend. It was the perfect freshman experience for me, and for reasons that are still not clear, I decided to major in chemistry. So when the year in Munich was over, I happily returned to El Paso, Texas. I arrived at University of Texas at El Paso, or UTEP, with no master plan of what I wanted to do when I got my degree. That all changed in my junior year when I signed up for an advanced biology course. The course director called me into her office and announced that there was not enough students that signed up for the course. We know about that. So instead of Taking the class, she offered me the opportunity to do a research project for a semester. On her list of mentors was Colonel Walter Decker, an adjunct professor, an MD, PhD at Beaumont General Hospital. His PhD was in pharmacology with an emphasis in toxicology. Dr. Decker was my first real mentor. I was a junior by that time, and I worked with him much longer than a semester required. This single experiment, experience, initiated by a chance occurrence, gave me the direction I needed and translated my interest in science to a passion for research. Of course, while I was in college, I continued to do the same thing that I always did. I showed up and did my work. The difference now was I was a lot more excited about the rewards of doing so. Unfortunately, my first big disappointment came pretty soon afterwards. I applied to the pharmacology PhD program at Ohio State Medical School and I was accepted. The disappointment was that I didn't have any way to pay for it. No tuition, no stipend. But it didn't stop me. I wasn't going to let it keep me from achieving my goals or showing up and doing my job. It was really tough at first thanks to both the financial stress of out-of-state tuition and the feeling that I was some kind of second-class student. 
Fortunately, before my first year was completed, I joined the laboratory of Dr. Daniel Corey, a professor of pharmacology who is also in charge of the Ohio State Toxicology Lab. Revenues generated from the tox lab were used to fund his students' stipends and their research, but you were expected to work for it. Once you were doing thesis research, your work hours were reduced to serving on an on-call basis for emergencies over the weekends. Many a night, I'd be sleeping on an air mattress in the tox lab while samples were being extracted. I also remember the time when I had to drive to Children's Hospital at 2 a.m. to pick up samples to be analyzed from a child who had ingested an unknown poisoning. I was navigating the deserted downtown streets of Columbus when a spark plug came loose and started banging against my car hood. I thought my engine was going to explode. Instead of panicking when I pulled over, I recognized the problem and I fixed it. I didn't even know what a spark plug was at the time, okay? It was an empowering moment for me. And it's a story my graduate students often heard when they started to complain about things. <laughs> a very effective tool to put things into perspective and to remind them, acknowledge the obstacles in your path, but find a way to get past them. And then show up and do your work. <laughs> So these experiences at Ohio State and Dan Corey's mentorship were transformational for me for different reasons. He encouraged all of his students to be independent and was completely open to new ideas. Translated, this meant we got to choose what we wanted to study. Unlike today's students, including my own, who were often given a specific aim on one of the mentor's grants to work on. Left to my own dev devices, I became interested in the biochemical triggers that initiated cell division. The model I chose to study was liver proliferation response following a partial hepatectomy. I was fascinated. You could remove part of the liver, and the remaining part would suddenly shift from its metabolic activities to one that begins to grow until it reaches its original size, and then it stops on its own. I quickly established the methodologies to start research and met with my mentor, Dr. Corey, not more than once a month, if that. Thank goodness I found someone who was not a helicopter mentor. And I always left these meetings with a sense of independence, confidence, and renewed purpose. The interaction showed me I had the capacity for independent thought and could identify questions to answer that no one else had yet addressed. Such a powerful gift we can give any student. That paved the way for another milestone. I was chosen for the Chauncey D. Leake Award by the Department of Pharmacology for outstanding performance as a student. I was the first woman graduate student to receive the award, and I also graduated with no debt from student loans. So for obvious reasons, I was proud of what I accomplished, but soon realized I had a lot more to learn. In 1977, I accepted a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health. My mentor was Dr. Michael Bevan. He was a very disciplined researcher. So I think that first year must have been very difficult for him. He was trying to rein in this wildly independent child, meaning me. But Dr. Bevan knew the importance of steadily publishing your research findings, and pretty soon I realized that that wasn't going to necessarily stifle my creativity, right? So looking back, I realized how fortunate I was to have two such different mentors in my formative years as a scientist. I hope my own students eventually benefited from the lessons I learned. This was also a critical juncture for me, the point when I realized that I really wanted to return to academia. I contacted Georgetown and received a polite letter from Dr. Frank Standard, Chair of Pharmacology. No positions were currently available. So my search finally yielded a faculty offer from George Washington University as an assistant professor, but on the research track. I admit I was disappointed but I decided to accept so I could apply for an NIH New Investigator Award, 
which would cover my salary and research expenses for a five-year period. In my last few months at NIH, I got an unexpected phone call to be interviewed for the HH position in the new Reagan administration, and I was asked to meet with a Dr. Arthur Hull Hayes, the newly appointed FDA commissioner, who was looking for a special assistant for science. He seemed thrilled to meet someone who was fresh off the bench with no political background or agenda. He also didn't hesitate for a moment to offer me the job, even when I told him I was pregnant with my first child. So it seemed like this would be an interesting interlude for me until I heard about my new investigator award. What helped to seal the deal, though, was the gift of a baby bottle of red, white, and blue jelly beans that I received from Dr. Hayes. He thought that was cute, being in the Reagan administration. <laughs> you might not be old enough to remember that. <laughs> so, in the early 1980s was an exciting and busy time at FDA. President Reagan was beginning the first term in his office, and there was a lot of pressure on agencies to deregulate and reduce spending. It was also, uh, I was also at FDA during the first years of the AIDS epidemic in the US, and I remembered attending one of the first briefings that the Center for Disease Control gave describing the outbreak of the opportunistic infection in the gay population. These early memories of the course of events and those that followed in the HIV epidemic were permanently imprinted in my memory. When I eventually arrived at Georgetown, they drove me to increase course offerings on the topic to the medical students and to ultimately change the direction of my research. This was also the point when I, became my, when I began my life as a mom. I gave birth to my first son, Alexander Moore Bayer, the day after Thanksgiving. It was one of the happiest days of my life, and I was consumed by this life that we had created. The, that coincided with another wonderful event. Dr. Robert Goldstein, the Chief of Allergy and Clinical Branch of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and Dr. Frank Standard at Georgetown each pulled their own punches to pave the way for my position at Georgetown. It was Dr. Goldstein who called me with the news that that new investigator award had gotten funded. And he said, and recommended on a phone call, that I was free to transfer the grant to another institution. I had no idea. I had a score on a pink sheet at the time. I had no idea that it was even funded. So I often think back to that call and the interest Dr. Goldstein showed me, some, somebody he, who he had never met. Um, without his intervention, I probably wouldn't be here. That said, having a new investigator award in hand and meeting Dr. Frank Standard at an FDA task force probably didn't hurt me. Okay. So I guess that means showing up and doing the work doesn't mean you shouldn't have a contingency plan. So I came to Georgetown in 1983 and quickly realized that I needed some help in the lab, particularly as teaching duties increased and I had to do something and decided to ask for more support. There might be some people here that still remember Frank Standard, who was this larger-than-life figure, really big guy with this John Wayne type of swagger and presence. He was very intimidating. And needless to say, I was very uncomfortable going in and asking him for additional support, but I had carefully calculated I could afford half of a technician, and I'm gonna go in there and ask him to pay for the other half. I asked him, he looked up from his desk, and he said, sure. I quickly left before he could change his mind, but just as quickly turned back and asked him, I couldn't stand it, what would you have done if I asked you for the whole salary? And he simply said, I would have said yes, but you didn't. <laughs> He let his first answer stand and taught me a very valuable lesson. <laughs> Always ask for what you need to succeed. So the next few years were busy with research, graduate students in the lab, coupled with increasing teaching responsibilities in both the medical and the dental schools. 
And then I expended, that was when I started exploring the effects of stress on the immune system and the impact of opioids on lymphocyte activity, and in doing so became one of the earlier researchers who saw the link between IV drug use and the risk of HIV infection. Thanks to the hard work of my early graduate students, John Jessup and Lauren Flores, my longtime friend and superhuman technician, Monica Hernandez, and the generous mentoring of Dr. Karen Gale, the other woman faculty member in the pharmacology department, that in 1987 I obtained my first R01 grant. These studies continued to receive uninterrupted NIH funding for the next 26 years. Equally important in 1987 was also the year that my son Andrew Michael Bayer was born. This meant that in the late 1980s, I was pretty busy with two young boys and directing a newly funded project at Georgetown. It was also a time a new president was coming to town and I was asked to serve on that presidential transition team for the Department of Health and Human Services. This was a behind the scenes look of the three month transition period between the election and the inauguration of the new president, George Bush. I'm bringing the short period up because it was a very intensive learning experience for me, not only because of the large scope of the task and the short time for deliverables, but also due to the significance of this work on future health policies and their funding, there was a tremendous pressure to get it right. By the time I was promoted to assistant or associate professor with tenure, I had been awarded a couple of R01s, both related to the effects of drugs abuse on the immune system, and three of my PhD students had graduated with their degrees. It was a good time to take my first and only sabbatical in 1997 to study with Dr. Carl June and the Navy Medical Research Institute in Bethesda. We shared an interest in T lymphocytes and their potential role in HIV and cancer therapies, and I wanted to learn some new molecular techniques necessary to study those interactions. When I returned to Georgetown, I was full of ideas and I had a lab filled with graduate students. I had been awarded an NIH training grant entitled Neurotoxicity of Drug Abuse, which funded some PhD students during their research, thesis research. It was a very busy time and if that wasn't enough, six of my PhD students graduated within a year and a half of one another. That was really hard. Several of these folks are here today, including Dan Mellon, Tricia Pellegrino, Rich Houtling, and Albert Avila, as well as Camille Morgan, the super tech who held the lab together during this time. I have been so fortunate to be surrounded by such great, smart colleagues. It was also during this time that Dr. Barbara Bregman, the inaugural chair of the newly formed Department of Neuroscience, asked me to join the department. It was not an easy thing for me to leave pharmacology, but the opportunity to help to shape a new department's research direction and mentor junior faculty was appealing to me. Alternatively, it could have been that that restless army brat was starting to surface and I just needed to have a change. Although my research activities continued, change definitely was in the air for both me and the medical center. In 2005, I was appointed the chair of the Department of Neuroscience. My basic goal as chair was to support this young department to maintain its productive research and academic missions. The strong dedication then and now of the neuroscience faculty to these missions made achieving this goal not only possible, but a pleasure. Over the years, they have shown up, did their job, and produced such a positive impact extending throughout the entire academy. I am so proud of their accomplishments and fellowships, and it's been my honor to serve them as chair for the past 13 years. In addition to my chair responsibilities, Dr. Howard Federoff, the new appoint, newly appointed EVP of the Medical Center, asked me to chair yet another task force on graduate education and shortly afterwards to become the Senior Associate Dean for Biomedical Graduate Education, or BGE. This appointment turned out to be a little bit more work than I anticipated. 
I was showing up for work, but quickly realized there needed to be some restructuring of the personnel and a change of the culture of the BGE office to get the job done. During this time, several key people suddenly left. I had a skeleton crew, and I was in a panic. Here is when my respected colleagues tried to be supportive and say, out of adversity, Barbara, comes opportunity. <laughs> Those that initiate change will have better opportunity to manage change, and then they went off their way. <laughs> but once things started to fall into place, I have to admit they were right. Over the last seven years, BGE has launched so many important initiatives to address the needs of our graduate programs and our students. Among the most important was the creation of the Office of Career Strategy and Professional Development. This office developed several strategies to help students to be successful through workshops, career advice, seminar programs, job fairs, networking, visits from alumni, as well as identify online resources for them to use. It also has developed support for faculty to be able to quickly respond to opportunities for new training grants for PhD students. In addition, several scholarship initiatives were created, which resulted in the recruitment of some incredibly talented and diverse students to our master's degree programs. This is only a partial list of the accomplishments of the dedicated staff of BGE, all of which are with us here tonight. Thank you, each and every one of you, for your dedication and your true commitment to our success of our students. So there you have it, a rundown of my life of learning described through experience, accomplishments, and relationships with many people. All of this has been wrapped up around my central theme on the importance of showing up and doing your job. But there's just a little bit more to this story, a little bit more about this life as a science and a teacher, and it's a little bit about me as a parent and the impact of being part of this learning community at Georgetown. In 2009, I took part in the Ignatius 19 Annotation Retreat for Georgetown faculty and administrators. Father Gaspar Lobiondo, or Father Gap, was assigned as my spiritual advisor. We met weekly to discuss assigned passages from the Bible and then shared our thoughts with the larger group. I grew to look forward to these discussions and the spiritual value they brought my life. Spiritual value I needed when I received a call from my son Alex and learned he was on his way to the hospital. At the time, he was an Apache helicopter pilot assigned to the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Later, he was diagnosed with a cardiac sarcoma, a rare and aggressive form of cancer. Although his prognosis was not good, over the next three years of his life, he bravely fought the disease, and he never gave up. Understandably, my sessions with Dr. Father Gap became sporadic, and one day he asked if Alex wanted to talk to him. Alex agreed, and he started to meet with Father Gap on campus, or when Father Gap would go to Walter Reed when Alex was getting scans or chemo. Or he called him when he was in Boston recovering from many, one of his many surgeries. I eventually lost Alex, but I am so enormously grateful for the family I have here at Georgetown, who unselfishly offered their support throughout his illness and the expertise of my colleagues that they generously gave me during that time. I learned that Georgetown is not a place for you to work, not only a place that you work and learn, it's a place of love and support. I strongly encourage you all to take advantage of what it has to offer like I did when I started the 19 annotation. Both my promise to Alex and this wonderful community is why I'm here with you now. But it's true that God does work in mysterious ways, and I was fortunate to raise two sons. Alex was the gifted athlete, the boy brimming with some confidence. Andrew was his younger brother, 
the quiet one, the sensitive one. He didn't grow up flying Apache helicopters. Instead, he grew up with a talent that no one else in my family has. In his late teens and early 20s, he blossomed into a musical prodigy. This became even more apparent to me a few years ago when a medical student approached the podium after one of my lectures. Instead of asking me to clarify something in my lecture, he asked me whether I was actually Andrew Bayer's mother. <laughs> Andrew, you are the love of my life. I am so very, very proud of you. I thank you for just being you. So I'm going to close with a tribute to one, one more, I promise you, just one more special person. The guest Jack invited to speak last November at our fall faculty convocation, Dr. Diana Natalicio, president of my undergraduate UTEP. I graduated the year she arrived, I graduated a year after she arrived at UTEP as an assistant professor of linguistics. She became the first female president of UTEP 16 years later and had a lot of work to do. Since then, she has grown a school which had only one PhD program when I was there to one that now has 22 PhD programs with a research portfolio comparable in size to Georgetown. Pretty good. In 2016, Time listed her among the top 100 most influential people around the world. Around the world. When I got a chance to talk with her, she said her goal from the beginning was to do everything she could to make higher education accessible and affordable to students. Although it's clear I am no Diana, I did learn we had several things in common. We both qualify as being mature women <laughs> who have been at their universities for over 30 years. We both are first generation college graduates. We both experienced unexpected chance occurrences in our lives which greatly influenced the paths we chose. We both had key mentors who helped us along the way. And we both have been fortunate to be in a community of learning with Jesuit values which have fostered spiritual contemplation, a high level of scholarship, and reinforced the desire to help others through education. Remember when I told you at first, when I went back and read all those speeches of past Georgetown faculty, these traits were also mentioned in many of their speeches. But equally as important is that as we educated ourselves and others, we showed up and did our jobs. So thank you for coming and listening to my message. Thank you, Barbara. I, I, I know I speak for everyone that we're overjoyed that you showed up here. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I now invite you to stand. <laughs> this is a Catholic university, standing and, and sitting. Is... For the singing of the alma mater, which will be led by the concert choir, the words and music, if you need them, are printed at the back of the programs to aid those few who, do, who haven't memorized them. Following the alma mater, remain standing, please, for the benediction. Father Joseph Lingen regrets that he's unable to be with us this afternoon, and the benediction written for this occasion by Father Lingen will be offered by Reverend Jerry Hayes of the Society of Jesus and director of the Ignatian programs.
Gracious and loving God, as we conclude our faculty convocation, we once again acknowledge your presence and request your blessing. Today we gathered together with a purpose, to listen, learn, and celebrate a life of learning, to recognize and commend those who have offered 20 years of dedicated service to Georgetown University. In addition, we gathered to, have, to honor and express appreciation for those who have demonstrated tremendous generosity and support of Georgetown, her tradition, her mission, through their induction into Georgetown's 1789 society. In our gathering and our honoring and our celebrating the work and generosity of these women and men, we humbly acknowledge your presence and generosity as well. We ask for your continued guidance and blessing upon our university and all her endeavors. Guide us with your grace and bless us with your wisdom. May your spirit continue to inform and empower all our efforts and may what we do reflect our honest desire to serve you, to form women and men of conscience and honorable character. We offer this prayer to you, our God of truth, wisdom, compassion, and mercy. Amen. This concludes the 2018 Spring Faculty Convocation. In the name of those honored here today in the university, I wish to thank you all for coming. I also thank the concert choir for their gift of song. And to Dr. Candy Bartoldus for conducting the choir today on behalf of Professor Binkholder, who was unable to be with us. I now invite all of you to join us in congratulating our honorees at the reception that will immediately follow this event on the second floor of this building. We invite you also to take, if you wish, a few minutes to visit the President's rooms, which are open for this evening's special event. Finally, if you will, please remain standing in your places until the procession has departed Gaston Hall. And I now declare the 2018 Spring Faculty Convocation officially closed. <laughs>